the Prairies to Woodlands Indigenous Language Revitalization Circle uh, applied for a grant for a master apprentice program through the Aboriginal Languages Initiative of Heritage Canada. So our program is uh, actually a pilot project where we have brought together fluent speakers, uh, usually elders, with uh, committed learners and they create teams where they work together to do one-on-one -on -one immersion in the community through everyday activities. Um, our program has uh, training, a training component where uh, these teams will come to a weekend workshop. There's actually three of them within this pilot project. We had one last September um, where we actually had 40 people come out. Uh, so that's in addition to um, the 10, 12 people that make up the teams. So we had six, actually five teams. And so we had 30 others um, come out to the workshop where they were also trained in master apprentice language learning techniques. And that's really what the workshop is, um, to help the teams understand um, the framework of the program, to learn uh, immersion techniques that will be useful on one, in, one -on -one in, in a one-on-one -on -one immersion setting. And also, of course, learn some of the, the basics about um, you know, the, the uh, administration of the program, paperwork, and also um, basic language documentation recording of, uh, of the elders that, so that they can use that for practice purposes. And potentially in the future, um, if the elders agree and the, and the uh, apprentice want to have those recordings archived for uh, language revitalization purposes, curriculum development, et cetera, in the future. So the program uh, is uh, 300 hours. It's a pilot project. Usually master apprentice programs are um, three years long and they are between 900 to 1,000 hours. We have um, a pilot project, so um, our funding will go until the end of March 2019. And uh, we had to wait to train our team so that they understood um, how to um, do a master apprentice program. So that happened in September. So they've had six and a half months to put in 300 hours. Um, the teams work together um, in the community. Uh, they decide on their own hours and they decide their own um, agenda, basically. Um, they work together so that fluent speaker works with the motivated learner to plan out what language learning is going to happen. And this language learning um, will happen through uh, everyday activities, cultural activities, and some of it will be somewhat scripted in the sense that, um, say, uh, an apprentice wants to learn how to, say, give a prayer, so that they would, uh, ahead of time, work with the elder to develop the vocabulary, a list of vocabulary that they need. Um, they'd learn that vocabulary. Um, they may listen um, if there are any recordings of prayers and things like that and then they would go through practicing how to do that but it's all done through immersion so English is not used at all and no written language is used during the actual one-to-one -one sessions. The apprentices may use um, literacy as a support. They, you know if they have a journal so they may write things down in the journal maybe they'll even have word lists but we, we're really encouraging recordings because what we want to create um, are fluent speakers. We want to create new speakers, so people that can understand the language and can speak the language and can do that and com uh, in a natural way and communicate in a natural way. Um, and that's really the program in a nutshell. So uh, it's learner-driven. Uh, the learner really is the one who has to take responsibility for what really goes on um, for their learning and work with the elder. And the elder um, is encouraged and, and given, is actually empowered to help the learner so that the elders will be, uh, learn skills in um, immersion. Um, for example, something like TPR, uh, total, total physical response. Um, so using uh, actions and gestures to convey meaning and uh, how to use that to teach language. Um, 
they learn how to do things like um, something like the accelerated um, second language learning um, acquisition. Uh, oh, I think I've got that wrong, but anyways, um, by uh, Stephen Gray Morning using uh, uh, pictures, um, images um, in a structured way. So people will um, learn core vocabulary and then learn what kind of words co-locate with that vocabulary. So for example, they might learn a woman, man, boy, girl, and they might learn some conveyances like a, a car or a bus or things like that. And they might learn some prepositions. So they would learn, first of all, just the, the words themselves. Um, and our way is teaching only in sentences. So it's a little bit different from that particular system. So we would teach them something as simple as that is, you know, um, that is a man, that is a woman, that is a car, and then go on to um, use a preposition with that, you know, and a photo so they can actually see it. So these would be pretty concrete um, things and they'd see it and then they, they would understand from seeing, um, seeing the photos. And in doing this, you're able to teach um, aspects of grammar without having to go, go through a formal um, uh, teaching of, of um, grammar points. So you're not going to have to use linguistics, you know, to, to teach that. So, and that's a really important point. So that, that's the kind of thing that happens. But it, it's as simple as doing your laundry together, going for a drive together, but it's all done in the language. And by allowing um, the apprentices to be immersed in language, uh, they come to understand um, they come to be able to speak naturally, and they actually sound um, much more like natural speakers than, than people that are taught in classrooms. So, you know, the other thing is it's relationship-based, and that really is key because as Indigenous people, we're very focused on, on um, right relations and doing things in a good way, um, this is a high value for, for many of us, or all of us. And um, do these people develop a relationship you know, the, with each other so that elders work with a younger person. And through the language uh, and through this relationship, they learn about how to express respect in the language. They learn how to actually relate. And some of that isn't simply through words. It can be through gestures, it can be actually where you position yourself in the room, um, uh, what, who speaks first, uh, how, how, just how you do things. And you can't really learn that um, in a classroom. It's very difficult to learn those kinds of things in a classroom. You have to be out in the world and engaging with people to learn that. So because Many of our languages, um, it's very, for many of our languages, it's very difficult to find places where we can go to be immersed in it. We, it's not like, say, Japanese, where when I was um, uh, young, when I was 16, I went to Japan as an exchange student, and I was immersed in the language there. We, we can't, we don't have um, the, those luxuries. We can't, like French, we can't go to Quebec and, and you know, and, and uh, well, we can go to Quebec and learn French, but we can't go, say, and learn Machif. There's really no community, for example, to learn Machif. And in many communities, um, language is not spoken on a daily basis out in the community. You just don't hear it that much. So even with Ojibwe, Anishinaabe Mwen, or, or Cree, um, depending on where you live, certain communities, uh, the language really isn't heard all that often. So you can't really just go to that community and expect that you're going to be able to be immersed. So we have to create these situations, um, somewhat artificial, but still relationship-based, to allow people to have an immersive experience. And that's really what we're trying to do with the program, is give people a, a, as much as possible an immersive experience. It's very demanding because it takes at least 10 hours a week um, so a lot of people have full-time jobs. Many of the people in our program are actually educators. They're uh, teachers. There's one is a, a principal um, and classroom teacher. There uh, is an, a university instructor. 
Um, there's also someone who teaches in um, the K-12 system and also at university. But they've all realized that there's really something missing, that the curriculum um, that's often used doesn't create speakers. And so that's why I really believe that they got, they've gotten involved, that they really want to create new speakers and learn ways to do that. So um, most of the people in the program are actually working with family members, which is really good because it, it uh, saves a lot of time in relationship building as such. And they can spend, you know, they, spend, they can spend that time together. Um, but the, the skills that they learn are actually, many of them are transferable also to the classroom. And so by being um, an apprentice or a master, depending, you know, if you're, if you're a teacher, um, you will learn um, skills that will enable you to enrich um, the K-12 or university environment because of understanding what it takes to do immersion and how to do that and also develop the confidence and I guess in some cases um, really um, become brave enough you know, to, to do that because it really does mean that you have to step out. You really have to step out. So it's a very simple program. Um, basically, it's two people uh, working together, not using English, using gestures, actions, pictures, whatever they can um, to stay in the language um, and not using writing. Um, it's been around for 25 years. It was uh, developed by Indigenous people for Indigenous people with the support of a of a community-minded and ethical linguist, um, and this happened in California, and um, it's uh, used around the world now. Um, the Mohawk people have used it in, in Kanawage. There's a, a program happening right now at SFU that is a, um, has aspects of, of um, Master Apprentice. They're actually doing an immersion, adult immersion program, which is fabulous. Um, it's used, uh, the Maliseet people, Mi'kmaq people have used it. Um, it's used all over BC, um, all over California, across the United States. Even in Japan, the Ainu people are using it. And in Australia, it's actually supported by the federal, you know, by their, their national government, actually supports this, um, this uh, master apprentice, which is also known as mentor apprentice program. And it's proven to create speakers. And that's something that is, um, quite amazing because we don't really see that for indigenous languages. We see people able to, you know, to have a conversation, a basic conversation. Um, but once they get out of um, their memorized, you know, um, phrases and, and scripts, um, people struggle. But with Master Apprentice, people know how to interact and speak. And that's really what, what, it's, what it's all about is creating creating new speakers. That's a big question, Indigenous education and the importance of um, languages, Indigenous languages for Indigenous people. And I would, I would add for, for all people in, in, uh, in Canada. Um, indigenous education is not, in my mind, something that, uh, that's really easy to define. Um, it's not really, for me, it's not really about necessarily indigenizing education. Indigenizing means to me that somehow we're taking a framework that is not indigenous and kind of tinkering with it to, to make it more indigenous friendly. Um, so that really isn't what it is for me. Indigenous education, I think, comes from, in, it is it something that has to come from a pedagogy that's based on the culture of uh, the people that speak that language. So Master Apprentice, for example, is based on visiting. And there are some people that say visiting is the Métis way, and I'd say that visiting often is the indigenous way, that you go and you visit with people and you develop those relationships first. And that's what I think um, indigenous education really is about. It, it needs to be within a framework of, of cre creating respectful um, relationships, reciprocal relationships. 
And again, um, with Master Apprentice, for example, um, there's research that's been done recently that shows that there's a positive effect on the well-being of both the masters and the apprentices um, when they're involved in this program. Uh, so everything from, you know, dealing with um, isolation uh, for elders, um, perhaps even more activities for, you know, they're getting out more. And that the, the apprentices, um, for example, uh, develop a stronger sense of self-identity and, um, and understanding of their place in the world. So language, um, I think, is, is really key to Indigenous education. Our languages um, also hold our worldviews and they are the framework um, in which we can express our worldviews and, and our relationships. Um, it's not that we can't do these things in English, of course we can, but the categories in English lang in the English language and the categories in Indigenous languages often don't match up. And sometimes there are concepts that just don't exist in um, non-Indigenous cultures or even other Indigenous cultures for that matter. So without having our languages, um, we, it is very difficult to express how we understand the world, what we believe to be true, how we know or come to know what is true. And then also, without using our languages, the methods in which that we use to understand our world or come to understand our world change as well. So English is an imperfect um, uh, vehicle for, for doing um, for learning uh, about our, our cultures, really. I mean, in a perfect world, we'd be using our language to learn about our language, uh, to learn about our culture, to do research, to teach, and that it would inform um, every part of our, our educational um, endeavors. You know, so without language, it's, it's very, I think it's very difficult um, to get to the heart of, um, of who we are um, because of that, like I said, the, the problem with the categorization and that, you know, if you have things in different categories, for one, you know, you, you don't end up with the same relationships. And the other thing is that how things are related and how they work together um, is very different as well. Um, our languages, um, most indigenous, not, not all, but many of our indigenous languages like um, Machif and Cree and Ojibwe, um, actually uh, are what they, I'll use a big word here, okay, so they're polysynthetic. I hate using words like that, but what it really means is that there's a bunch of pieces, small pieces of meaning, right, that get stuck together in one word and are related in a particular way that one word can mean a sentence. And so when you understand that that is actually how our, our languages are, you know, when we want to express our worldview and we use English, which has a bunch of very separate words, it's not that we can't do the same thing, but there's many things that are expressed together and already expressed in relationship to each other. So it's, it's those kinds of things. It's like not only the, the, the flesh, meaning the, the meaning of the words, but the bones of the language, the structure of the language itself. Um, is full of, of meaning and it's full of our, our cultural um, understandings, you know, and uh, so I think that, you know, without having um, language being first, in, you know, being central to Indigenous education, it's, it's very difficult to, um, to bring back um, and sustain reclaim um, these ways of knowing and being in the world. Again, I can't really speak to uh, Indigenous education as a whole, but I look at language education. Um, my hope and dream is that we would develop um, adult immersion programs, first and foremost, um, where people would have between 3,000 and 4,000 hour contact hours in the language, um, 
So this would likely be at the post-secondary level. Um, we know now, research is showing that that is really the most effective way um, to create new speakers especially new speakers who can be creative in the language and use the language and not, um, not just rote memorization. Uh, part of that, the next um, I can see is Master Apprentice. Master Apprentice can be part of, say, you know, a, a, an adult immersion program, say at the university level, four-year program in adult immersion. Um, but Master Apprentice is, uh, the use of Master Apprentice is extremely important because it allows us to address smaller languages that are critically endangered, where we don't have a critical mass, where there may be only a few speakers left. So Master Apprentice, the extended use of Master Apprentice um, at the university level for adults in particular. And the reason why I keep on speaking about adults um, is that we need to create um, speakers that have the power to change things for our children. and. We, have to, we need that first and foremost. We're losing a lot of our fluent elders, and um, some of them are not well enough to say to go in and do language nests or teach in the K-12 system. Um, so we need to create these young people, these younger people that are able to carry the torch, so to speak. So we need to really focus on that. And there's a lot of youth that are, are really interested in and, and wanting to learn, but they just don't have access to programs that would really support um, their learning in the most effective ways. So there are other, you know, other programs that, you know, I, I can think of, you know, we can have communication-based instruction, you know, more classroom-based and, you know, that are not, that are still immersive, but maybe are not as intensive. But the time is now for our languages. Um, really many of our languages are critically endangered. And if they aren't as a whole, like they often there's talk about say Cree and Ojibwe and Anuktitut, you know, that they may survive, but they may survive, but they're not gonna survive in every community that they're spoken in. There are communities where those languages in that particular community is highly endangered, critically endangered, is almost non-existent. Um, I know of a young woman, a Cree speaker, who lives in Southern Saskatchewan, and she said that there are, uh, so few Cree speakers on her reserve that, you know, she really is, is learning her language on, on her own and trying to do kind of a master apprentice approach and she works in the, the daycare. But, you know, Cree as a whole is not endangered, but you look at that reserve, for example. Um, and I look at our languages, I'm, you know, I, I'm Métis, I'm a Machif, and uh, the Machif language is critically endangered. We're at the point where, um, if we don't work now, we don't, we may not have 10 years, really. So I hope within 10 years, we're going to see uh, more programs that support the most critically endangered languages and bring them forward like Machev. Um, and there are other languages that are equally, you know, endangered. Maybe not so much where in Manitoba, where, where I live, but we need to start moving very quickly um, so the next 10 years, yeah, but I'm really right now looking at the next year, two, three, four, five, um, because that's where, where we're at with, with you know, um, with, at least with Machif. Um, but I think for all of our language, really it's adult language immersion. And if we get the adults um, speaking, then, you know, especially if we get young adults, then we've got people that, are going to be able to speak to their children, right? So we're going to bring language back into the families, and that's where it belongs. Language revitalization has a place in education, but language belongs first and foremost in our families and in our communities. Education has a, really has a supportive role. We've got the cart in front of the horse a little bit right now, you know, where education, a lot of language teaching and learning goes on within institu you know, in institutions. Where it really needs to happen is in our families and, you know, out in our communities. We need to hear our languages out in our communities. So that's something that we need to bring um, education out and have it bridged more between um, families and, and community members and have that, you know, 
have the division to be more porous and have people engaged more. Because without that, you know, we won't be able to speak to anyone. People can learn the language, but they leave university or they leave school and there's no place to go where you can speak. And that happened actually, you know, just to underline this, it happened in our, it happens in Ireland. They have immersion programs, you know, through, you know, up through high school. And I met a woman in Saskatoon, an Irish woman who came over, immigrated with her, with her spouse. And they both went through this immersion, immersion schooling. And she said that it, that was great, but there was no place to speak it. There's very few places, even in Ireland, where uh, Galtak, the area where I was just spoken, it's very small. And there weren't really, even really community uh, clubs or, or, you know, language tables or really anything like that where they could go. So she said they've lost their language. She's losing her language. Obviously, she's over here now, but she said even in Ireland, because there weren't places in the community, because it wasn't being spoken in her family, she just learned it at school, and there were no places in the community to use it. So that's really right now why I think education, um, Indigenous language education, needs to focus on um, adult learners, because these adult learners have the power to change things for their children. They have power to change things for their communities. These adult learners can, you know, some of them will be getting masters and PhDs and they'll be well positioned to move this agenda forward. So although we do need to teach our kids, we need language nests, you know, and we need immersion programs, real immersion programs, preferably not bilingual, but actual real immersion programs in the schools. But if we don't address the need for our adults, new adult speakers, who's going to carry this on into the future? Because a lot of our, our fluent speakers are older, retiring, you know, and we have to address the succession planning now.